Our sermon text this morning is Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 12. It's Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today, to go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know, and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. Do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or of the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Remember, and do not forget, how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, and the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. When I went up to the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord made with you, I remained on the mountain forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. And the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And at the end of forty days and forty nights, the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you have brought from Egypt have acted corruptly. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made themselves a metal image. Let's pray. We praise you, God. You are our God. You have made us. You have made us for yourself. We pray today that as we open your word, you would help us to see how much we depend on your grace. How we can never say that we are blessed by you because of how good we are. Help us to embrace the truth of our own unworthiness. Rejoice in the truth of your amazing grace. And trust the provision that you've made for our sin in Jesus Christ. We want to magnify Christ today. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We're starting the book of Deuteronomy, and we are now in... Deuteronomy is itself uh, perhaps three speeches. Three speeches that Moses is giving to uh, his people before they enter into the promised land. Uh, this is the second speech, uh, and uh, the three previous sermons we looked in chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8, uh, some of the ways, uh, as this second speech began, that the Lord meant for the people to respond to him and to live in faith toward him, and that is that they were to live outwardly as God's people and actually inwardly as God's people. Their heart was, was supposed to be toward the Lord, and their actions were supposed to be uh, from the Lord. And now we turn today to speak, as we, as we dig deeper into the second speech, uh, we turn to see how God wants to emphasize how God's dealing with his people is completely of grace. Uh, it is by God's grace that God's people are blessed by God. And that is how uh, this, uh, this is how we ought to think about this text. Actually today, um, by the way, I'd just say this is a, this is a familiar Bible theme. Uh, the Bible's uh, theme is that we all uh, don't deserve God's grace. Uh, all the good things we have from the Lord are undeserved. And it is of his kindness that he blesses us with things that we have not earned. Uh, this is, again, a Bible theme. And when we think about this sort of Bible theme, I think probably you oftentimes, I, I know that I do, think about the gospel itself. 
And there's something about the setup of this uh, chapter, chapter and a half, we're looking at chapter 9 and in, into the beginning of chapter 10, that I think works along a, a sort of a gospel theme. And so that's going to be what we're going to use as our sort of outline here. Uh, sin, uh, beginning with sin. Uh, then uh, here uh, we're going to focus on um, the intercession uh, that is being done, and then a restoration, and we'll spend perhaps less time on that because we'll pick that up again next week, but restoration in chapter 10. So, so let's think about sin. Uh, and that is really verses, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 24. Uh, let's just begin with verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Now, by the way, if you've been with us very long, you, think, you, you would think, well, gee, this is, this is one of these things you keep talking about, Pastor Jeff. You keep talking about uh, the sin of the people. Why do you keep wanting to talk about that? And I just want to remind you, I didn't write the Bible. I'm just reading the verses from the Bible. The Lord is saying in chapter 7, you don't deserve it. The Lord is saying in chapter 8, you don't deserve it. The Lord is saying in chapter 9, you don't deserve my grace. Right? So, so the Lord insists on reminding his people, as it were chapter by chapter here, that they don't deserve God's grace. And here he is emphasizing, you are stubborn people. So uh, what the Lord is doing in this section, though, is he's saying, look, I'm going to give you the land, right? But I don't want you to think you're getting the land because you're really great people. And as a matter of fact, let me talk for a while about how you're not great people. That's, that's a pretty simple outline here, the first 24 verses, right? I'm going to give you the land. It's not because you're great, and let me remind you about how not great you actually are. So let's, let's think about this a little bit. The Lord does mean to give the people the land. He means to bless them. Verse 3 says, Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. So the Lord is going to go over before them right, as a consuming fire. This means that they're going to go into the land, but the Lord is going to go with them. As a matter of fact, the Lord is going to go before them. So that, and what we'll get the idea here is that if you're going to have the victory, God will give you the victory. God will be fighting for you. And that's, again, a theme of the Bible. That God, God's people need God. The Lord blesses, him, blesses them. But the Lord goes before them as a consuming fire, picking up the rest of verse 3. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. Right? The Lord will do it. And then it says, uh, finally, and you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. So the idea here is that the Lord is going to do the work. The enemies are too powerful for God's people, right? They are, they are very strong and mighty, and, and the Lord's people are comparatively weak. But don't worry, the Lord is on your side, so you will have the victory because the Lord will fight for you. And the way that it works is not, well, the Lord's going to fight for you, so why don't you guys sit down over there and I'll tell you when to go in when the work's over. No, the Lord says, therefore, since I'm going to fight for you, let's go. Right? So the Lord calls his people. And so sometimes we get confused. We think, well, well, I did something. <laughs> I mean, the people could have gone into the land and said, well, we, we did some fighting. And sure enough, they did. But they could forget the reason they won is the Lord. <laughs> the reason they won is because the Lord fought for them. And that's the challenge, actually, in the Lord working through us. Sometimes we do, the Lord says, do something. We do something, and we forget the only reason what we did succeeded was the Lord. And we begin to get a big head. And the Lord here is saying, by the way, look, you're going to go into this land and uh, don't begin to think that it's because you are particularly righteous people. D don't think that. D don't begin to think too much of yourself. Think much of the Lord. Stop thinking so much of you. And the reason why the Lord has to do it chapter by chapter is that we just keep going back to it, don't we? Each one of us likes to think, well, uh, the Lord did say do this. I didn't do it for a while, but now I do it. And so it must be because of me. And the Lord just says, no, stop that. Stop thinking that way. <laughs> uh, the, the Lord is working in you. He's working through you. He is making changes in you. But the changes in you are from the Lord, not from you. Always honor the Lord. Don't think much of yourself. And again, the fact that it shows up chapter after chapter after chapter reminds us that we need to hear it often. The Lord does not, again, want them to think too highly of themselves. So he says in verse 4, Do not say in your heart after the Lord has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness. Right? I know why. They're bad people. We're good people. Of course, we fall into that at church, don't we? We're good people. We go to church. They're bad people. They don't go to church. That's why we're going to heaven. We're good people. No. No. And so the Lord here 
who's working with Israel saying, you're not good people. You're unrighteous people. And uh, the people then must not think too highly of themselves. They must not rely on themselves. They must not become proud. And the Lord here is giving them right doctrine. By the way, some people don't like doctrine. I don't like these doctrinal things. Well, the Lord means for the right doctrine, that is you're sinful and not as righteous as you think you are, to help you live differently. And if you don't have the right way of thinking, you'll go around thinking, I actually am quite great. And you need right doctrine to come in and say, you're not that great. You, you need to, your only hope of living out humility instead of pride is the Lord reminding you of your sinfulness and of your dependence on him that you would be helped through this right doctrine to live out a true humility. And so the Lord is speaking true doctrine to them to help them live a life of full dependence upon him. Now the Lord does lay out five, uh, three reasons rather why they're going into the land. Uh, verses 5 and 6 lay that out. Uh, one reason the Lord is giving them the land is he's saying, I'm giving them the land because the nations that are in there are wicked nations. And we've talked about this before, so we won't spend much time on it, but the, the Lord is driving out wicked nations. Uh, and so the second reason the Lord is giving them the land is the Lord promised he would give them the land. Look, I told your fathers I would give them the land, and here I am doing it. And by the way, you should love, every time you see the Bible say, uh, the Lord made a promise and he kept the promise, you should love it. You should love it because he's made you a promise. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you trust in Jesus Christ, you will be saved and you will have eternal joy with him forever in heaven. That's a promise he's made to you. And if you don't think he's a promise-keeping God, I don't know. Will you get to heaven? We'll see. But if you know, if you're convinced, if he makes a promise, he will keep it. He does not make a promise that he breaks. He always keeps his promises. Then you and I can have confidence in our faith in Jesus Christ. And we don't have to say, well, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Just stop it, right? We can say, I, 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 I have hope of eternal life because God has made a promise that I trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. My sins are washed away. I will hear no condemnation on the last day of judgment, and I will be with him forever. And it is that promise that he has made that I am clinging to, which is my confidence that I will be with the Lord forever and not suffer the punishment that I know my sins deserve. So we love that the Lord keeps promises, and here we are reminded that the Lord keeps promises. And verse 6 says, and, and the Lord is doing it not because you're righteous, but despite the fact that you are stubborn. And, and, and then the Lord uh, goes on to explain, uh, through Moses here, the ways, you know, how, am I, how, are, how do you say that, that I am stubborn? And the Lord says, let me count the ways. The Lord, the Lord says, I've got all kinds of ways to tell you guys how stubborn you are. And he focuses on really two main events here. Uh, in verses uh, 7 through 21, he recounts the golden calf. Remember how the Lord gave uh, his ten words, the, the ten, ten commandments there in Exodus? And, and while uh, the Lord is giving the commandments to Moses, the people are busy down below uh, building a golden calf. Uh, this incident and, and the response is, uh, comes up with, or is one of those instances in which we have the all-time worst excuse ever given. Do you remember the excuse that, that Aaron gave when Moses came down and said, what have you been doing? And he's like, well, I just threw the gold into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> and you're just like, really, that's the story you're going to go with, Aaron, huh? The story that you just threw some gold in there and a, and a calf came out. But that's how, lame, that's, how, that's how lame pretty well every one of your excuses for sin is. It's just as lame as that. Uh, there's no good excuse for your sin. Uh, and, so, uh, and so we see the Lord, though, is responding to the sin of the people. Uh, and he's responding with anger. He's responding. He's upset with the sin of the people. And then a second sin that's recounted uh, in, in later chapters is their failure to take the land, verses 22 through 24. I'll read verse 23 to you. Then when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up to take possession of the land and I get, that I have given you, then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God and did not believe him or obey his voice. So basically the Lord says, When I gave the, the commands especially the one about no graven images, and I hadn't even hardly, it hardly came off the presses before you've already made a graven image. Uh, that's, an, that's an example of your sin. And then when I told you to go into the land and trust me, they are powerful, but I am more powerful. Trust me, do what I command you to do. And you guys said, no, you showed yourselves to be unbelieving. And the Lord summarizes then their unbelief in verse 24. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. 
It's strong language from the Lord, isn't it? And so the Lord is talking to Israel and it's saying to Israel, don't begin to get a big head when you get into the land. Because you're not in the land because you're righteous. You're, you're, you're going into the land despite the fact that you're unrighteous. And by the way, to bring it back around to us again quickly, is just to say you're not saved because you're good. You're saved despite the fact that you're not good. Right? If, if you are saved today, if you're trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you, you're saved. But, but you're not saved because you didn't become as bad as those other people. No, no, no. You are sinful. And, and your only hope is to come to terms with your own sin. Come to terms with your own sin. Come to the end of your own claim to righteousness. And call out to the only one who can save you, Jesus Christ. Well, one of the other things that we see here is the consequences of sin. Sin has consequences. Now, the first consequence is that the Lord is angry. Right? Uh, verse 20. The Lord was so angry with Aaron, he was ready to destroy him. Right? The Lord is angry with our sin. But the other thing that we see is the Lord begins to distance himself from the people. Look what he says in verse 12. The Lord is talking to Moses and he says, look, look at your people. <laughs> Isn't that a funny way to talk about, for the Lord to talk about his own people? Hey, Moses, look what your people have done. He's like, I I'm done with them. They can be your people. And a little bit later in verse 14, he says, let me alone that I may destroy them. Right? The Lord is going to distance himself from them that he may destroy them. And one of the things that we're reminded of here is the one of the great blessings we have from God is God. I would just say the greatest blessing we have from God is God. And, and, and what the people lost through their sin was a, a bit of their closeness to the Lord. And by the way, I think the Bible teaches us to think in these terms. The great thing you lose in your sin is not, you know, a, a hit on your reputation or, you know, some, some little consequences here and there that, you know, maybe you, you didn't quite do as well in this as you thought you would. The, the great thing that you stand to lose in your sin is a close fellowship with God. Because when God gives you himself in close fellowship, he's given you the greatest thing he could possibly give. In your presence is fullness of joy, right? You want joy, don't you? In the presence of the Lord, that's where great joy is found. Right? So some of us still think, you know, possessions is, brings us joy. <laughs> you know, this earthly friendship brings us joy. And, and in God's kindness, we get a measure of that. But the sort of enduring joy that can never be removed alone comes from our fellowship with the Lord. And when we sin, we break that a bit, don't we? And so the Lord wants the people to see that, that when you sin, that when they sin, that they bring a separation between the one who alone can bring them joy. And again, I think that's a lesson we need to learn. What harm could come if I did this? Nobody will ever know. Nobody will ever, never, nobody will ever find out this deep, dark sin I've just done in my heart. And you need to preach to yourself, do I value close fellowship with the Lord? And if you do, by God's help, <laughs> value close fellowship with the Lord then you will pray by God's help that you would put away that sin. That you might treasure your fellowship with God, pursue that fellowship with God, hate anything that you do that brings a rift in that close fellowship because you have experienced, by God's help, the joy of that fellowship with the Lord. Well, the question that I just want us to reflect on before we move on to the next point is, are there sins here at Stony Hill? Are there sins in your own life? And I hope every single one of us, although we're not saying it out loud, is saying, yes, of course there are. Of, of course there are sins in this church. Of course there are sins in your life. How could it be otherwise? We're foolish to think. That yes, God liked Israel despite their sin, but he liked Stony Hill because we're really great people after all. <laughs> How foolish we would be. God loves Stony Hill despite the fact that we are sinners. Only God is righteous. Right? Righteousness is living by a righteous rule and then carrying it out. 
But in my own life, I, I want to do what God says, and many times I don't do it. I wanted to be nicer to that person than I was. I, I wanted to think better thoughts. I wanted to keep back that word. I wanted... I, I can't be the only one who doesn't live up to my own expectations of me. I'm not righteous. You're not righteous. That's fine to admit. That's, you have to admit it. Because once you admit it, you say, well, what's the hope for me? Jesus Christ. The hope for all of us unrighteous people is Jesus Christ. I just want to spend a few minutes thinking about some ways that the Lord wants us to press into holiness. I think this will be helpful. I hope it's helpful. Again, we'd be foolish to pretend that we are the, the, the best church at evangelism, wouldn't it? We're the most mission-minded church that there is. We really love our neighbors. Everybody around us knows how much we love each other. There's never been a fight at Stony Hill. Everybody loves everybody the same. No favorites. No gossip. Everybody has compassion for everybody. And of course, in a sense, it's to our shame that we say, of course, this is not true. But Lord, we want it to not be true. We, 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 we want it to be true that we are more missions-minded than we are. We want it to be true that we are more kind to each other than we are. We want it to be that there is less gossip here, more, less division here than there is. And so while we're resting in the gospel of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, let us press into seeking God's help. That the things that matter to God matter to us as a church. That it matters to us as individuals. It's not just whether or not the church is more evangelistic. Am I more evangelistic? It's not, are those people out there nice to each other? Am I nice to people? Do I think less of people than I should? Do I speak unkindly? And every one of us must go through this. Open for the Lord to show us the reality that we've been ignoring. That we're really not as good as we think we are. Week by week, we come, we, we confront God's word. We have God confront us with his word to show us our sin. Not that we can beat ourselves down, but that we can see God's heart for us and say, God, I want that heart for me. These are not the things I've been longing for this week. I've been longing for this and that, but I can see you want me to be longing for holiness and righteousness and kindness and compassion and care for my neighbor. And those aren't even things I even care about as much as I should. And Lord, forgive me. And by your spirit, strengthen me that I may make your priorities my priorities. Well, we have to move on. Secondly, after sin, we have to see intercession. Let me read verses 25 and the beginning of verse 26. So I lay prostrate. This is what Moses did. So I lay prostrate before the Lord for these 40 days and 40 nights. Get that. 40 days and 40 nights, he is interceding for the people. 40 days. And 40 nights. Because the Lord had said he would destroy you. And I prayed to the Lord. O oh Lord God do not destroy your people. So we see that Moses intercedes for the people. So someone stands between a holy God and sinful people and says Lord. Don't destroy them. And we see in this intercession both a love for the Lord. And a love for the sinners don't we? Intercession comes from a concern for the Lord and a concern for the people you're interceding for. And that's exactly what Moses is doing here. He highlights in these verses, verses 26 through 29, five things. He says, I pray to the Lord, O Lord God, do not destroy your people, your heritage. That's the first thing. Don't just, these people are your people. He next reminds them whom you redeemed through your greatness, who you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You've redeemed them. They're your people, and you've already done the work of redeeming them. 
next, he reminds them in verse 27, remember your servant, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, you've made a promise to them. Do not regard the stubbornness of this people. So Abraham's not saying they're not stubborn. He's saying, I know they're stubborn, but, but, but show mercy. The wickedness of their sin, verse 28, number 4, lest the land from which you have brought us say because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land that he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness. Now he's, now he's concerned about the Lord's reputation. You've brought these people in, and now all the people... Who, who your people are going to dispossess are going to think small things about you, but you're great. So the Lord, so Moses is concerned about the reputation of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the Lord be glorified among the nations. In verse 29, he says, For they are your people, again, returning to that theme, your people, your heritage, whom you brought. And so some emphasis here is, is the fact that these are, in fact, your people. Lord, these are your people. And you have already done the work of, of, of mightily blessing them. And think about the glory of your name, Lord. This is what Moses prays. And I don't have time to spend... Uh, something had to be cut from a sermon, and this reflection, which will be briefer than I meant for it to be, on just the effectiveness of prayer I want to think about just for a couple minutes... The question that we all, people oftentimes ask me, does prayer change things? Did, did, did Moses change history here? Um, I, I think the right answer is that it's, it's a challenge because we have a sovereign God uh, working out his plan. Uh, and we have God using means, right? Uh, so I would say the answer is probably yes, prayer does change things. But we should not conclude that the prayer changed God. So let me take a few minutes thinking about that. Um, one place, what we have here in, in Deuteronomy, by the way, is a summary of what the intercession that, that Moses did uh, for the people in Exodus 32 and 33, and again in Numbers chapter 14. Remember, there was two places of sin, so there's two places of Moses' intercession. And we have a bit of a summary of that in these sections. So you kind of have a longer section. If you wanted to spend some time on the longer section, you could go read it in Exodus and read it in Numbers. Uh, and we just have a few verses here in Numbers chapter 9 and chapter 10. So uh, let me point to one section of intercession there in Exodus chapter 33 in particular. Uh, in, in that section, as Moses is interceding for the people, he says to the Lord, look, Lord, I don't want to go into the land if you don't go in with me. It's one of those beautiful passages in which Moses is basically saying, if you're going to give me that land and not you, if that's a choice, if there's a choice to have that great land and not you, or not that land but have you here, I want you more than the, than the, than the land. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Right? It's a, it's a good time for you to reflect. If the Lord said to you, I'd give you heaven, streets of gold, mansions of glory, all that, but I won't be there. Or you can not have heaven, but be with me. Which do you want? And I'm not, I'm not so sure what people would answer. But we know the right answer. In your presence is joy. So, so the Lord without heaven is better than heaven without the Lord. And as a matter of fact, heaven wouldn't be heaven without the Lord. That's just another fact, factor to think about. But but, but the Lord is the most valuable thing. Him giving us himself is the most valuable thing. Moses reflects on that here in Exodus 33. I'm not, I don't want to go into the land if you're not going there. And then, uh, and, and then, the, then the, Moses says, look, you being with us is the great thing about us. We're unique. We're, we're unlike the other nations. Not in prosperity. Other nations have prosperity. Uh, our uniqueness is that you are our God. We, we treasure you. We want you. And again, I just want to take that as a theme for our church. What's unique about Stony Hill, I hope, is that we treasure not the numbers or the buildings or whatever we've got, but we treasure we have the Lord, and I hope we do. We want to be the people where the Lord works and where the Lord dwells and who enjoy the Lord and who walk with the Lord. If people come to see the greatest thing about Stony Hill, if there's anything great, is that the Lord is among them. Oh, that that would be our heart. But Moses, in this context of Exodus 33, says, Lord, I want you to show me your glory. And the Lord says this in verse, uh, Exodus 33, now verse 19. The Lord says, I will make my goodness pass before you, 
So the glory of the Lord in part is his goodness. Make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Isn't that an interesting thing about the Lord? The Lord basically says, if you want to know why I'm great, it's because I'm good, right? If you want to see my glory, see my goodness, right? I, I just for your reflection. If you want to reflect on the greatness of God, just reflect on his goodness. Because, because when, God, when God was asked to show his glory to Moses, the Lord showed his goodness to Moses. So if you want to grasp in a greater manner the glory of the Lord, reflect this afternoon on his goodness. But then also note that this good God, an essential part of his goodness is that he will show mercy where he wants to show mercy. It's interesting, isn't it? I will show mercy on whom I will show, I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And so God's glory is showing mercy where he wants to show mercy. The other thing I would just say real quickly, and again, I said this was going to be brief, is that intercession doesn't always succeed in the deliverance of people, right? So in the case of Moses interceding here for uh, the people uh, at Sinai, and again, when they didn't enter the land, uh, that we might say that was a bit of a success. But under Amos... Uh, Amos is interceding here in Amos chapter 7, and we're not going to turn there for the sake of time, but in, in the first six verses, there's, there's a possibility of destruction coming upon by, the, by means of locusts, and in two times, there was intercession, and the Lord intercedes, he, he relents in the first six verses, but then when you turn to verses 7 and 8, the Lord actually brings the destruction. And the Lord does bring destruction. If you just read through the Bible, sometimes the, Lord, the, the people pray for re release and they don't get release. And again, we're reminded. He shows mercy where he's going to show mercy. He's gracious where he's going to show gracious. But he, he's not bound to show it ever. That's why it's called grace. He doesn't owe you grace. He doesn't owe you forgiveness. If he owed it to you, we could, we'd stop calling it grace. We'd stop calling it undeserved. He has to do it. But he doesn't have to do it. That's why it's so amazing. Now, we do know that God uses means. So when we come to prayer, we see that God is at work in the one who prays. And one of the things we have to see is that God isn't there with his idea, I'm going to destroy these people. And these people are over here with their idea, oh, I'm a sinner and I guess I've got it coming. And Moses comes in and goes, hey guys, i got an idea. You know, and God's like, I... That's a good idea. I had never thought of that, Moses. Thank you. Like, Moses isn't coming in with his own ideas, right? As, a, as an independent third party between God and sinful people. None of us, in one sense, are completely independent. God is working, willing and working his own goodwill inside of us. Isn't that what Philippians 2 says? For God is at work, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, so we might say then Moses' intercession is the Lord stirring up Moses to intercede. The, the Lord had made of Moses the sort of person who cared about the glory of the Lord and loved the Lord and his glory and cared about the people. The Lord had made Moses that sort of a person. Now, if we don't believe that, then in this intercession, it looks like Moses is more honorable than the Lord is. The Lord's got a bad idea. Moses comes up with a better idea, and the Lord's like, Man, I can't believe I wasn't thinking like you, Moses. Good job there. Saved me. But once we see Mo Moses, what Moses does is the work of the Lord in Moses' heart. Then we say it's a, the Lord's grace in Moses' life. That Moses had a heart for the Lord and a heart for people. And, the Lord, and, and Moses intercedes in a way that the Lord was pleased to respond to positively. But it wasn't the Lord was absent in Moses' life. The Lord was the reason behind Moses' intercession. This is what makes figuring out whether or not it changed things a complicated question. But at the end of it all, I think it is the Lord who ordains not only the ends but the means. And in this case, he ordained the means of Moses' prayer that he was pleased to respond to. We have to move on. 
I would just say, by the way, the, the Lord does not merely work through intercession from someone like Moses. I think we ought to think we should intercede. Uh, we, we ought to be the kind of people who both love the Lord and love sinners. Maybe you have a lost family member, a lost ch unbelieving child, an unbelieving parent, an unbelieving neighbor, and you love the Lord and you love these people, and you are standing in the middle and you're saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, be gracious. I don't know that it takes 40 days and 40 nights of intercession, but, but it does please the Lord to answer prayer, doesn't it? I think we would do well to see that the Lord sometimes calls on us to intercede for unbelievers or for a wandering saint. We don't know. I mean, when someone's wandering, are they, have they proved themselves an unbeliever or are they just wandering around a little bit? You don't even have to know the answer. Just, Lord, help them. They're not where they should be. In all of this, we pray, as Jesus did, not my will, but your will be done. But Lord, I want, I want to see this person return. And we know that when we pray to the Lord, we're praying to the one who will always do right, always act righteously. Well, finally, before, uh, as we end, close up this section, we're thankful for Moses. We're thankful for the intercession of Moses, but what the people really need is somebody better than Moses. The, the gospel message is not just get some great godly man like Moses to stand between sinners and, and a holy God. That's all you need. What you need is someone greater than Moses. And the Bible says that there is someone who, as a matter of fact, is in those exact terms called greater than Moses. His name is Jesus. Let me turn your attentions to or, sorry, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For everyone, every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. The main idea here is that Moses was great. There's, he spoke to the Lord face to face. He was great. But as great as he was, uh, in this pa passage, he's compared to a house. He's like, he's like a very great house. But who built the house? God. I think we're getting back to the idea of how did Moses become Moses? How did, how did Moses become one who cared so much about the glory of God and for the sinners? How did he become that sort of a person? God. God's the reason. God built Moses. So Jesus is better than Moses because Jesus is the reason that Moses turned out to be who he was. Further, I just suggest to you, you need to remember that even though Moses interceded for Aaron, Aaron lived another 38 years, Aaron died. Moses died outside of the land. So whatever greatness we see in Moses, we see he also himself was a sinner who because of his sin didn't enter the land. Moses needed somebody better than Moses. And now we're reminded of Hebrews chapter 10. Beginning in verse 11, every, every priest stands daily in his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. We don't need an intercessor who's a mere human who needs to atone, as it were, for their own sins. We need a greater intercessor than even Moses was. We need Jesus Christ himself. And that's why this, past, this sermon, like every sermon, has to end with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our only hope is one who has interceded for us and made up for our shortcomings. As righteous as Moses appeared to be, he was not righteous enough. He needed an intercessor. And there's only one great intercessor between a holy God and sinful men, and his name is Christ Jesus. And I call you today to repent of your trust in your so-called righteousness 
and to trust in the only one who has successfully interceded for you with his own blood. I'm calling you to faith in Jesus Christ today. And as I said, this sermon was going to end up with uh, a brief thought on restoration. I just have two minutes or less on chapter 10. Uh, we'll pick it back up next week. But look what happens in chapter 10. In chapter 9, we see that, that, that Moses had taken the tablets and he'd thrown it on the ground. Why did he do it? He broke the tablets. What was he doing? He was saying, you have broke the covenant. You don't deserve the fellowship with God that you have. You, you've broken it. And yet we see in chapter 10, verse 2, that the Lord comes in and writes it again. As it were, there's restoration here, isn't it? It's the same covenant being written again. He's not writing different words. He's writing the same words. And I will write, the Lord says, on the tablets, the words that were on the first tablets that you broke. And so the Lord brings restoration. The Lord takes us from us messing everything up and brings us back into a right fellowship with him. But recognize that your right standing with God is not dependent on you keeping the Ten Commandments perfectly or you keeping the commands of God perfectly. Right? Don't get this mixed up. It's the people the Lord has already saved. The intercessor has already come. There's already a right relationship here. And he says, if you're in a right relationship with me, this is how I want you to live. And so if you are here today in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. Now the Lord wants you to live by his commands. But just don't think my right relationship with God is because I keep the commands. No, you don't do that. Your relationship with God is because of Jesus. But because of Jesus, you are called now to live by God's commands. We must get this right again lest we mislead our neighbors into thinking we we're right with God because we're good people. Our neighbors know that we're not good people. I mean, we're not, that bad. we're not the worst people they know, but we're not perfect. So we, it helps us put in place our right standing with God is Jesus Christ, and as God's people, we live by God's commands. But we must get that right, too, lest we mislead people on the gospel. So we end with this, a trust in Christ, and then looking to Christ by his help that we might walk as he commands us to walk. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. Uh, thank you for the way that your word makes it clear that we are saved by grace. Uh, we are not former sinners. We are sinners still. Uh, by your work in our heart, we perhaps sin less than we used to, but we still sin. Every day in our sin, we prove we need a Savior, and we praise you that you sent Christ to intercede for us and sit down at the right hand of the throne of God that we who trust in Christ by faith can have our sins washed away. But we do pray, Lord God, that as you have worked salvation in our hearts and you've given us new hearts that now want to walk in your ways, we pray that we will. Not in our own strength, but in yours. Not in a way that tries to make a name for us, but, but points everybody to you as the one who strengthens us, who enables us to do the things that you command. Help us to pursue holiness uh, by your help in a way that brings honor and glory to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.